Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, book launch tonight of Can We Talk About Israel? Uh, the author of whom, Daniel Sokach, is our wonderful global CEO of the New Israel Fund, someone who we love and admire very much. It's great to have him particularly join us uh, at midnight where he is in San Francisco. So thank you to Daniel. Thank you to everyone for joining. We always start our events with an acknowledgement of country. So I want to pay my uh, respect and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on here in Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to pay my respect to their elders past and present and acknowledge that uh, that we're on Aboriginal land where sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, we, like I said, have a wonderful conversation coming up tonight uh, with Daniel. I wanted to start, first of all, before we jump in as well, by uh, acknowledging what a big year it's been. Uh, obviously, in Australia, still kind of lots of, apart from the few people, I think, who are joining us from the uh, from Western Australia, a year of lockdowns and difficulties here, of course, following on from a year of difficulties last year as well. Um, and despite that, uh, support for NIF has been uh, continuing and has been continually positive and continually engaging our great community. So thank you to everyone who's been coming to our events. We've had, again, thousands and thousands of people joining some really great events that we've put on uh, and to deal with what was actually a very interesting, uh, perhaps unexpectedly interesting year in Israel, uh, a new government, the end of Bibi Netanyahu as prime minister, at least for now, um, a devastating war, a devastating clash between Arab and Jewish citizens in Israel, which I know Daniel will have more to talk about later. And I think now with the new government, we see these moments of optimism and some moments of hope that uh, for us is really encouraging. It's encouraging to see our friends, our NIF friends uh, in positions of power and to see over the next little bit what that, what that becomes. Uh, for those of you who have been to many NIF events over the years, you'll remember that we had events with people like Meirav Michaeli and, uh, and Tamar Zamberg, now both ministers in this government. That's an exciting thing that we have these connections and we have these friends. So amid all of that, we've had some really brilliant events. Lots of you have come. So I wanted to start tonight off by thanking everybody for that. Um, I'm going to jump right in and give, uh, give the framework for tonight. Uh, so Daniel in San Francisco will be chatting for about half an hour or so, a little bit more than that with Ilana Snyder, our president. I'll introduce them both in a second. Then after that, um, Sharon Berger, our program manager in Sydney, will be coordinating and running our Q&A with Daniel. So if you do have any questions that arise, um, you can either type them in the chat. I know lots of you are using that already. Uh, or you can click the raise hand button on Zoom. And what we'll do is we'll uh, come to you. Sharon will call on you. We'll uh, get you to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask your question of Daniel. So that'll be in the second half of proceedings tonight. So our, our introductions then and our uh, bios for both of our wonderful people facilitating uh, this conversation tonight about Daniel's book. Daniel uh, will also be known to many of you as people who have been around NIF for a while. He's visited Australia a number of times to help build our community. He's been the CEO of NIF since 2009, which is a long time. Uh, and under his leadership, NIF has really blossomed into an organization that has significant power base in Israel, a significant power base in more and more countries around the world. Um, before that, Daniel was executive director of the Jewish Community Federation of San Francisco. Uh, he was also the founding executive director of the Progressive Jewish Alliance, which is now known as Ben the Ark. If you haven't heard of the organization, I very much recommend uh, Googling it and looking out for it. It's a really special organization in the States. Uh, four times Daniel's been named to the four newspapers, Forward 50, an annual list of 50 leading Jewish decision makers and opinion makers. He's contributed to leading newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, and is the author of Can We Talk About Israel? A, cur a guide for the curious, confused, and conflicted, which we're very happy is now in the country and we can start uh, uh, offering to all of our NIF supporters. And joining him uh, for our conversation tonight is Ilana Snyder, who's been the president of NIF Australia since 2015. She's an emeritus professor in the Faculty of Education at Monash University, where her research and teaching have focused on critical literacy education in the digital age. So with that, I'm going to hand it on to Ilana and Daniel. Uh, and remember to keep your questions in mind, type them in the chat. And uh, when Sharon gives us the go ahead, you can uh, you can hit the raise hand button and get started. So thank you, Daniel, for staying up late. And uh, Ilana, go for it. Well, first of all, I have to say congratulations, Daniel, on a simply marvellous book. 
I had to, I spent some time thinking about how best to describe it. Um, it's in part a history book, but it's also a book that draws from history. It's political commentary. It's a textbook of sorts. And it's a manual for how to think about and support Israel. In some ways, it's a manual for political activism. How would you describe the book and why do we need this book now? Well, first of all, um, thank you, Ilana and Liam uh, and Sharon and Eve and all of you for, for joining. Um, it's, it's, I can see it's a beautiful day uh, down there. It's the middle of the night up here. Um, but I, I, I'm moved to tell you all that in my, on my first trip to Australia for NIF, really when things were just getting started back in, in 2010, I was incredibly moved at the first uh, public event that I did when when the speaker, whoever was introducing the event, um, paid tribute and honor to the native peoples who had on whose land we were we were uh, speaking. And it was completely alien to me and very moving. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we have followed your example. And at least here in California, um, it is now commonplace for us to do what you taught us to do. And um, I think it's an incredibly moving and powerful reminder and apt for our conversation tonight. So I just wanted to begin by, by saying uh, how much I appreciate that lesson from you all and how important it is for our work. Um, so Ilana, <laughs> the, the, by the way, um, I can't ever complain about doing a midnight session because, uh, because Ilana and Liam show up to all of the things that we do globally, not complaining. So I feel that I don't even have the right to kvetch about being up late. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, it, when I thought about writing the book, um, one of the reasons why I felt it was important, because of course, right, as you inf as one infers from your comment, there are a lot of books about Israel out there. Um, but my feeling was they really fall into two broad categories with, with some significant exceptions. And the first category are books that um, I would diplomatically describe as advocacy pieces, right? These are books that um, that represent any any of the various uh, parties to the conflict or or opinions about Israel and the challenges that it faces um, that that are really meant to engender support, empathy uh, for a particular position of a particular party to the conflict, and these can range from fairly mild um, advocacy pieces. Two more more strident ones. Some of you may be familiar with the name Alan Dershowitz, a, a, a very prominent Harvard Law School professor in the U.S., who wrote a book a few decades ago called "The Case for Israel," which sort of sums it up, all the way to screeds or polemics, and and these exist on all sides of this conflict. The other broad category of books are what I think of as books by scholars for scholars, books by experts for experts or by specialists who are really going deep into some particular aspect of Israeli history or the conflict. And those books have a challenge because even though many of them are excellent and vital, they're not particularly accessible to the general reader. So I felt that that's where I saw a lacuna. And, and it struck me that the books that had really influenced me as a young person when it came to Israel um, were books like Thomas Friedman, uh, again, a New York Times columnist who wrote From Beirut to Jerusalem, um, the books of David Grossman, the Israeli novelist who wrote uh, several nonfiction books about his travels around his country, speaking with Arab Israelis and with Palestinians on the West Bank. And most importantly, uh, the book by the late great author Amos Oz, who, uh, who the book In the Land of Israel, which which was had a profound influence on me when I read it. And, and I wanted to write something that would really serve as a toolkit um, for people trying to come to terms with how to relate to Israel and how to navigate the complexities. Um, so and, and I thought that was missing for for us now. And that's what I, I, I tried to uh, contribute. And I think you've done a fantastic job. The, and the other, the book is really beautifully designed and produced. It's got wonderful illustrations by Christopher Nixon. There are sections that pop up every now and then that are shaded in gray. We'll come to those um, in a moment. And there are also reflective notes at the bottom of some pages. And at the end, there's the lexicon of the conflict. And the, I think that the, um, these elements somehow match the, uh, the book's complex objectives. Um, can you talk about how you arrived at these design elements? Yeah, sure. Well, um, 
first of all, um, you know, the, the sort of opening premise of the book is that Israel is a topic about which so many people have such strongly held feelings and opinions, deeply emotional um, and powerful positions, but about which they don't necessarily know all that much. Um, and, and to my mind, the whole subject reminds me of the proverb of the blind men and the elephant. Remember this one? You know, these a group of blind men come across an elephant in the jungle and each one touches a part of the elephant. And each one assumes then that what they're touching is the elephant. So for one of the blind men, an elephant is a trunk and another one, it's a it's a leg and another one, it's a tail or an ear. You get the idea. And of course, they miss the bigger picture of the whole elephant. And I feel that um, so often in this debate, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, whether you're American, Canadian, Australian, British, Israeli, Arab, um, you generally have a good sense of one part of the elephant, right? Or you may have no sense at all. Um, but we have these received narratives because of of who we are, how we grew up, what what level of religiosity in what religion, what news we read or listen to or find online. Um, and, and these things cause us to sort of uh, feel that we know a subject that is much broader than what we know. So um, in order to have an, an intelligent opinion and, and, a, and a means of engaging in an intelligent way with the subject, if I feel you really have to know a little bit about what you're talking about. So the first part of the book is arranged, um, as you say, as sort of a history, which I hope is interesting and digestible. Um, and, and I try to leaven it throughout the book. I, I leaven it with um, with sort of anecdotes about my own experience and development as a liberal Zionist, a supporter of Israel, who's also critical of Israel, which I hope will be interesting. Um, part two of the book is the sort of deep dive once you've gone through the history. And by the way, for me, that history is animated, uh, none of you will be surprised to learn, by my love and connection to this place, but also by a, a genuine compassion for and curiosity about both of the narratives of the two people who claim that that strip of land as their home. And um, and so, you know, I do come with a with an agenda. Um, I know you want me to talk about that in a minute, and I will when you ask me about it, Alana. But, you know, I genuinely believe that these are two people who, in the words of the, the Israeli historian Benny Morris, are righteous victims. They're victims of the world, of each other, of themselves. And they both have re totally legitimate claims to this territory and totally legitimate connections to it. And in order to dive deep into the issues that roil the debate today, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, is Israel an apartheid state? Uh, the settlements, the relationship for me, uh, an important piece was the relationship of the American Jewish community, which of course is the other uh, large global Jewish community to Israel, the changing nature of the relationship, the role of Arab citizens of the state. In order to have an intelligent engagement about those things, you have to work through the history. So part two is the deep dive. Um, leavened again by by these personal anecdotes and then finally there is as you mentioned the the lexicon which is like a handy glossary uh to reference my one of my daughters who's in college now read it and said dad uh the lexicon's really good why did you write the rest of the book which i thought was the <laughs> ultimate college daughter question but all of this you know the reason i uh, it was my wife's great idea to have christopher knoxon um illustrate the book i i knew i needed maps and graphs she said you know, we have this friend who is a very talented uh, illustrator and artist and an author. She said, you should ask Chris to, to do the drawings. So I did um, in the interest of accessibility, right? The tone of the book is conversational. Um, and, and the drawings, I think, really gave people sort of a way in. And he then said, well, rather than just maps and graphs, how about I, I, I sort of do some, some illustrations? And I was so taken with what he did. And so was my publisher at Bloomsbury that we included a bunch of them in the book. Yeah, they're fantastic too. Let's get back to the history, the facts, uh, the, the the long history, because you cover thousands of years, but really it's it's, it's about a hundred years that you really focus on. Right. Um, there are lots of dates in that chronology that are important, but the ones I would love you to talk about are 1967, the Six Day War, followed by the Yom Kippur War in 1973, 
and then in 1995, Rabin's assassination. I know there are many significant dates in the book, but can you just tell us something about these three significant dates? Yeah, well, you picked, you know, you picked three of the big ones, as you know, and 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 you could have picked, you know, there are maybe three others that 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 equal that, but you really picked, um, you picked three of the dates which were pivots upon which history turned. I believe most obviously is is probably sixty seven, right? When when Israel's sort of greatest moment of triumph holds within it the seeds of Israel's, I would argue, greatest challenge, right? That is. Um, what I what I call Ben Gurion's triangle, um, because in in fall in September of sixty seven, uh, Ben Gurion himself emerged from self imposed uh, retirement down in the desert to to uh, to come to Jerusalem to speak at a think tank amidst the euphoria and ecstasy of of the deliverance of the six day war and any 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 sort of like he issued a Jeremiah appropriately enough to to his fellow Israelis saying. You have to give it back, even if there's no one to give it back to. You have to get out. We can't keep all this land and the people in it, and be a democracy and be a Jewish state. And I think of this as Ben Gurion's triangle, right? And with the exception of the previous occupant uh, of Balfour Street uh, and perhaps the current one, we don't know. Virtually every prime minister, you know, from Rabin on obviously including uh, Ben Gurion when when he made this comment has concluded something similar that you that you have to choose two points on that um, on that graph of identity it, it, you have to be uh, if, if, if obviously if you control the territory and the people in it and you're a democracy you risk being voted uh, out of being Israel and a Jewish homeland if you hold that land and, and control those people and you remain a Jewish homeland, you will no longer be a democracy, right? There's a word for what that political arrangement is, but it's not in English or Hebrew or Arabic, it's in Afrikaans. And uh, and so the only the only choice left, Ben Gurion argued, by the way, he said, we should keep East Jerusalem and the Golan, but everything else he said, we should give back. Um, but the only choice then is to, is to, is to get rid of that territory. And I, th I think that, um, you know, th th f for, for me, um, making this, clear to people um, is, 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 is the, was the important task of 67, but also sort of showing how that's the moment when everything changes for Israel. Um, because of course it doesn't um, follow Ben-Gurion's advice. Uh, it tries and fits and starts at, at times to do so, but ultimately it's unable to, or, or, or for, for many reasons, um, you know, that advice of Ben-Gurion's is not, uh, is, is ultimately uh, it doesn't come to fruition for a lot of reasons, not all of which were Israel's fault, but of course, Israel's settlement enterprise, which you know has gone on and on since 1967, has made that even more challenging. So, so that's that's the hinge upon which history turns. 73 is is critically important, also, and and sometimes a little bit overlooked because it's um, it's two things. One, it's the puncture of the hubris of 67, right? When when the idea that um, that that the Israelis are are the are the lords of, of of the land that they're the unchallenged rulers of the Middle East. You know this comes to a crashing halt only a, only six years later with um with the semi successful plan of on well really successful plan of Anwar Sadat. Um, but of course the real the real message of seventy three is um well I would argue is a, a more controversial one. The author Nathan Thrall. Um, wrote a book called The Only Language They Understand a couple of years ago. And in it, he argued that um, despite the common conventional wisdom that you can't force Israelis and Palestinians to a lesser degree to do things they don't want to do, you have to, the parties have to want to make peace. Thoreau argues, no, that's not true at all. In fact, if you look at history, it's only when there's pressure, right? Pressure from each other, pressure from the outside world, military, political, economic, cultural. That's the only time parties change. And 73 is one of the profoundly powerful first examples of this, because of course, Sadat's gamble pays off. And in showing the Israelis that they still have a, a foe that could be an existential threat, he convinces the leadership that it's time to, the Israeli leadership, that it's time to compromise. And then, you know, 95, which is a very personal one for me, because I lived in Israel, uh, leading up to that moment and and i have to just say you know and i don't mean to embarrass you eve but when i when i look at young people um who who are who are nifers uh 
I sometimes think to myself, you know, I, I, I was born in 1968, but I had the vision, the beautiful vision of, of Oslo, of, of those golden halcyon years to inspire me. And Liam and Adam, you know, they're a bit younger, but they also had that memory. But Eve, you know, you and your generation, you, you, you don't have any of that. And yet, and here you are still rolling up your sleeves and fighting. And for me, that's one of the most moving parts of this work are our new generation people, our, our new gen, as we call them up here in the States, um, whether in staff or in our volunteer ranks, that's powerfully moving to me because 95 was the end of the last golden moment when Israel could be for many of the people on this on this call uh, a, a place that we felt really totally proud of and totally inspired by. And since then, it's been a lot more complicated. And I think that, you know, uh, 95 is so critical for a terrible reason, which is that, you know, the assassination of Yitzhak, Yitzhak Rabin may prove to be that rarest of things, which is a political assassination that achieves its goals, right? When Abraham Lincoln is, is murdered, um, it's true reconstruction goes a different way here, um, but but he doesn't, you know, slavery is over and the union is preserved. And when, uh, when John F. Kennedy is assassinated here, um, the union is preserved. And when Martin Luther King is assassinated, civil rights doesn't disappear from the agenda, it marches forward. But in Israel, the assassination of Rabin, and then you know the uh, the 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 second intifada and the horrific terrorism uh, from from uh, some on the Palestinian side and the incessant settlement enterprise on the Israeli side really may have been that thing that changed history. And so ninety five is a, a, a profoundly depressing date in the calendar, not just because of the the horror of of the Retzach, of the murder of the assassination, but because we've never gotten back to where we were. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another part of the book that is um, really um, important is the power of the physical maps that are drawn throughout the book. And there are many, many maps. And you point out that a lot of contemporary maps don't have the green line anymore. Now, what does that, what an impact does that have on the way Israeli citizens think about the state? Yeah, and by the way, not just Israeli maps, also Palestinian maps yeah. don't have the green line. Look, I think, um, I, you know, there's a chapter in the book where I really look at this, um, which is a chapter, by the way, Alana, I thought to myself, you would like this chapter, right? Like it's one of, you're one of the people who I had in my head as an audience for the first chapter, I believe it is in part two, which is, which I call the map is not the territory, which is a look at the way that both sides um, have, have, have tried to erase the presence of or connection um, of the other, quote, other, to the place, to the land. And their maps, you know, cartography is a battleground. And um, the, the fact that many official Israeli maps, and as I said, official Palestinian maps, don't show the green line is an, an, an act at, you know, at, it, it's, it's cartography as a weapon. Um, and the, the erasure of the green line on the map of Israel that you see in your synagogue in, in, in Melbourne or San Francisco, let alone in official maps out of Israel or the bus maps that every Israeli encounters when they're, they're looking at planning their routes through Jerusalem, the absence of the green line is a deliberate thing, right? Which, which is, you know, part and parcel of an attempt to knit the settlement enterprise uh, uh, ever closer to Israel proper and to blur in the minds of Israelis the distinction between the settlements on the one hand and Israel proper on the other. And I, I don't, there's an anecdote that I didn't tell in the book, but uh, a few years ago, I was interviewed by Makori Shon, which is sort of a religious right-wing paper in Israel, but a sort of respectable religious right-wing paper. I mean, they interviewed me. Uh, and, um, and, and it was after one of, it wasn't, it was maybe in 2015, but it was just after an election. And um, they came to the office in Jerusalem and they did a whole, you know, front page spread about this interview. And at one, and the interviewer was a young guy who had introduced himself, and he lived in in um, Gush Etzion, in you know the the large settlement block, the first one built after sixty seven, close to Bethlehem in Jerusalem, and uh, and he had so he mentioned where he lived, and then he asked me later on in the interview, where you know how I felt about the election, and I said, well, we're a nonpartisan organization, you know, we're 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 concerned, of course, about the policies that this ultra right wing government is going to pursue. Um, but we don't really weigh in on your politics in terms of partisan politics. I said, I have to say, however, 
on a personal note, it's strange and disturbing to me that you got to vote in this election uh, and the people who live in the same territory that you live in, which is not Israel, 2.9 million of them didn't get to vote. And he looked at me like I was completely bonkers. And he said, what are you talking about? I, I, you know, I live, I live in the Gush, I live in Israel. And I said, you don't live in Israel. Your government has never annexed your territory where you live. You live in an Israeli town that was built in territory Israel conquered in 1967 that, 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 that Prime Minister Eshkol's own legal, legal advisor said uh, was, was occupied territory that Israel was not permitted to build civilian settlements in. So whatever you might think about where you live, it's not Israel, and that's not me defining it, that's your government, and yet you get to vote and be an Israeli citizen with all the rights and privileges, and those 2.9 million Palestinians don't. And he said, you know what? I never thought of it that way. Mm. And that, I think, encapsul like that, that, there you go. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the second part of the book, why it's so hard to talk about Israel. And the reason is that the reason why um, Friday night dinners and, and dinner parties uh, explode with emotion is that there are some very thorny issues and you cover a lot of them in the, uh, quite a few in this second part of the book. But I'd love you to talk very briefly about the two A's that you have that you cover in this. In this right. Episode. So there's there's one chapter in the book that I call the A word, which which is apartheid. And then the second one, the other A word, which is anti-Semitism. And um, what I say about the first, A, you know, the reason why I had to I felt I had to write about these is because they are in the discourse. So we could avoid them. You know, we could stick our heads in the sand and pretend that conversation isn't happening here in the States anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure to what extent it's happening down there, um, but here it's happening. And as you know, um, over the last year, a number of human rights organizations, including Israeli human rights organizations, but also the major international human rights organizations have argued that Israel's control of the West Bank amounts to the international crime of apartheid. So it seemed important for me to sort of confront this issue, even though I began writing this chapter before those uh, human rights groups opined as they did. And there, you know, very briefly, I always say, look, it's not a soundbite, right? Um, and my anecdote that, that is essentially that chapter is that if you give me a group of intellectually honest left-wing critics of Israel and you let me take them up and down the length and breadth of the state of Israel for a couple of weeks and talk to Israeli civilians and officials, Arabs and Jews, Mizrahi, Ashkenazim, religious, secular, Ethiopian, Russian, etc., if, if they see uh, the fact that the third largest political party up until the last election was an Arab political, largely Arab political party, there's an Arab on the High Court of Justice, um, they, they would ultimately have to conclude that they saw a lot of um, institutionalized racism and discrimination, not only against Arabs, but against other groups as well. Um, an imperfect, stumbling country, but one that in no way resembled the apartheid regime in South Africa. Uh, at the same time, if you give me an intellectually honest group of right wing supporters of Israel and you let me take them up and down the length and breadth of the West Bank for two weeks and they saw they speak with settlers and Palestinians and soldiers and see the checkpoints, not just between Israel and the territories, but between Palestinian territories and the Swiss cheese patchwork of control, the matrix of control, as some have deemed it, the Israeli only tunnels and roads forbidden to Palestinians, the inequitable distribution of land, resource, building permits, water, uh, all based on an immutable characteristic of birth, right? The accident of who you were. Um, you'd be hard pressed to say, uh, by the and of course, the massive military presence that's there to safeguard that sort of settler enterprise, you'd be hard pressed to say that didn't look like some of the more pernicious aspects of apartheid. So that's the first A word. It's, it's, it's complicated. It's not a soundbite. Um, the second one, uh, <laughs> all I'll say about that is, you know, I open that passage, that chapter by saying, is being critical of Israel anti-Semitic? And I answer no, except when it is. And then I say, is being an anti-Zionist uh, always equivalent to being an anti-Semite? And I answered, no, except when it is. And I think that, you know, like the famous, uh, there was a Supreme Court justice in the earlier part of the 20th century up here in the States called Potter Stewart. And he once said famously of pornography, I know it when I see it. And here I'm trying to give readers the tools to navigate and understand when criticism of Israel is legitimate, reasonable, however painful it might be to you, and when it crosses the line into anti-Semitism. Mm 
Yeah, and there are so many other thorny issues that you deal with, but you'll all have to buy the books and, and read about them. Um, I found the lexicon really interesting. That's maybe because my whole career has been looking at language and the use of language. It highlights how terms have different meanings for different people. And Zionism is one of those words that you include in the lexicon. How do you define um, Zionism? And, of course, the big question, which I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times, as, uh, as have I, are you a Zionist, Daniel? <laughs> um, <laughs> Zionism, of course, I mean, Zionism is the, is, is the idea and movement uh, in, in pursuit of the idea that there ought to be Jewish self-determination in a homeland in, in what is now Israel. So <clears throat> I've always found this debate over Zionism to be a bit of an anachronism, kind of like asking if I'm pro-union or confederate in the American Civil War, right? I mean, this was, it, it, you could make a strong literal argument mm -hmm. that, um, that sort of the question about whether one is a Zionist or not ended in May 1948 when the state of Israel was established. Mm -hmm. However, no one will let you do that, even though that's really the right answer. Because what people mean when they ask you, are you a Zionist, of course, is a number of things, but not that thing, right? I mean, I guess some people might be asking, do you think in 1948 it was reasonable for Jews to achieve self-determination in the land that is now the state of Israel? But really what most people are asking is, do you approve of the policies and actions of the state of Israel? Do you think that there should be an Israel at all? Are you pro-Israel? Are you critical of Israel? Um, but instead of having that conversation, we get stuck in the Z word conversation. So for me, what I always say is, um, if Zionism, if by Zionism, since I've already defined it and no one seems to want to use the actual definition of, of Israel, for me, um, if Zionism means that the 13th and 14th paragraphs of Israel's founding document, its proclamation of independence, where it's written that Israel will be a, a, a homeland for the Jewish people, for the ingathering of the exiles, as it says in the document, and an open, equal, free society for all citizens, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, national origin, then that's that's my Zionism right there. Um. Thank you. Look, a favourite part of the book for me um, with, the, with the grey bits, and one of the most wonderful grey bit in the book is the story of Brandon. And I'd love you just to tell very briefly the story of Brandon. So the story of Brandon, um, <clears throat> that's one of my favourite bits in the book too, is um, my kids were at a wonderful liberal Jewish summer camp they used to go to out near Yosemite National Park in the mountains of Eastern California. And one year I was asked to come out and do some teaching with the staff because you had these counselors, these very progressive lib liberal Bay Area Jewish, you know, college students. And then they had shlichim, they had counselors from Israel who were out of the army um, and they were clashing increasingly and not finding any common ground on this topic of Israel. And the camp director asked me to come out. And since my girls were there, I thought, what the hell? It's, it's Yosemite. It's beautiful. So I went out. I worked with the staff. And of course, you know, any of you who have been to summer camps know that if there's like free educational assistance, every counselor will say, will you talk to my bunk? So I ended up talking to these kids and and I always said yes. And one day I spent a couple of hours with a group of 11 and 12 year old boys and or 10 year old boys. And um, they were wonderfully precocious. And I, I decided, what the hell, let's let's have this conversation. And so we kind of did a version of the first part of the book. We raced along Jewish history. They knew more than anyone would have thought they did. Um, and we sort of told the story together to get us to where we are now. And when we got to the part about, about you know, the, 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 the movement of Jews from Eastern Europe to Israel in the early 20th century, um, this kid, Brandon, spoke up you know and i had said there was a motto that the zionist movement had um a land without a people for a people without a land which was false right and we talked about that and this kid brandon says wait a minute let me see if i get this straight he said it's like my family has always lived here on my farm and my grandparents and great grandparents and great great they always lived here even if we didn't own our building we paid rent to someone we always lived here for hundreds and hundreds of years and one day we come back from the fields where we're working and he points to the boy next to him and he says and this kid and his family are living in half our house and we say what are you doing here and they say well we we bought this house we come from a place thousands of miles away uh in a village and everyone all the jews in our village were were murdered 
and our homes were burned. My family escaped. No other country would take us. Once our great, 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 great grandparents lived here, we bought this house and we came and we had nowhere else to go. And he says, is that kind of like what happened? And I said, Brandon, <laughs> you've just described it better than 95% of the grownups I've ever spoken to about Israel. Now, as well as, wonderful, as Brandon's wonderful story, or this wonderful story about Brandon, I also loved Amos Oz's prose poem about a drowning person that resonates throughout the book. And I, Daniel, I'd love you just to read that um, piece from Amos. I thought you might ask that, Ilana. <laughs> um, and I did, I did use that image throughout the book. I returned Indeed. to this image because I thought it was so powerful. Um, so I, I, I mentioned the book that this, that this, um, that, that, uh, that influenced me so much in the land of Israel. But here's another thing that, um, mm. this is what, this is one of the things that he wrote in that book. Uh, in his masterpiece, In the Land of Israel, the late Israeli author and peace activist Amos Oz writes that Zionism has, quote, the justness of the drowning man who clings to the only plank he can. And the drowning man clinging to this plank is allowed by all the rules of natural, objective, universal justice to make room for himself on the plank, even if in doing so, he must push others aside a little, even if the others sitting on that plank leave him with no alternative to force. But he has no natural right to push the others on the plank into the sea. And as I then go on to say, between Amos Oz and Brandon, they pretty much got it all right. You did. And I just want to end with one, because um, we want to get to people's questions. And this is a question that everybody has about Israel. Why do so many people who <clears throat> are neither Jew nor Arab, who have never been to Israel and don't know any Palestinians, scrutinise no other world situation so closely? And how does the occupation in Israel attract a different kind of attention than, say, in Hong Kong and Tibet? So just a little easy question for your last yeah. question. <laughs> Look, I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of answers to that question. And some of them are, um, you know, my original title for this book, by the way, was, if, if I may be a little bit profane, yes, yes. it was Israel WTF. You, you all have that same saying down there, I yeah. assume. Why one small Mediterranean country drives so many sane people completely nuts or something to that effect. And I think that part of the answer to your question is, is, is found in my flip working title for the book. Yeah. First of all, you know, uh, Israel complicates things for non-Jews and non-Arabs, especially Europeans, um, who, who look at when Israel acts, when Israel's a bad state actor, which it sometimes is, as is Australia, as is the United States, right? Um, the level of opprobrium that is sometimes focused at Israel, especially from Europeans, I'll come to the global left in a minute, um, <clears throat> I think has to be understood through mm -hmm. the lens of the guilt that many Europeans feel about what happened. Also, the guilt that Americans and Australians and and, and Brits feel about not um, allowing Jews to come into their country. So there are complicated layers. You know, there is a perverse uh, gotcha feeling when Israel acts badly that people who have a long history of horrifically abusing or ignoring the plight of the Jews, um, I think, react to in a way that's different from other places. That's number one. Number two. Um, China, you gave the example of, I'm just jumping around here with my reasons, right? Um, you know, China never claims to be a democracy. It doesn't say it's a Western nation with, you know, that wants to be or la goyim, a light unto the nations. Um, Israel does. And when Israel acts in a way, you know, Chinese occupation of Tibet and now what's happening to the poor folks of Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, the Chinese say, yep, this is our hemisphere. We control it and we'll do what we want. Um, the Israelis may feel that way, but that's not how they put themselves out there in the world. So if you want to be a democracy and reap the benefits of, of, of being a democracy, mm -hmm. being having the EU as your number one trading partner and having the might and protection of the United States of America on your side, um, you if you act in a hypocritical manner, then you're going to get a level of appropriate from the people in those countries um, if you claim to be a democracy. Uh, third, at least here in the States, Israel receives more of uh, foreign aid than all other countries combined, right? And more than any other country. Egypt is is number two. So American citizens increasingly feel, you know what? We we have a right to weigh in on this debate, not only from the you know being totally supportive of Israel, but being critical of Israel. Um, number four, 
one of the most interesting learnings for me in researching and writing this book was getting a far deeper sense uh, than I had previously, uh, a, a deeper dive into the world of Christian Zionism. Uh, this is an evangelical dispensationalist fundamentalist movement that's rep that represents tens of millions of Americans. And it's the reason why Netanyahu and his former ambassador to the US, uh, UN, Ron Dermer, on a hot mic, a former American citizen, was caught saying, we don't need American Jews anymore. We've got the, the, the evangelical Christians, of whom there are many, many more than there are American Jews. Um, and the, the theology of these dispensationalist Christian Zionists is is one that requires the Jewish people to go back to the land of Israel to fight to not cede territory uh, and ultimately to bring about the end times right the Armageddon and the apocalypse and unless you think this is just crazy wacky stuff right the former the immediate past vice president and secretary of state of the United States of America were avowed mm -hmm. Christian Zionist and Mike Pompeo the former secretary of state when asked uh before he became secretary when he was still a congressperson whether he thought Donald Trump had been sent by God to bring the Jewish people back to Israel said that may very well be true. So this is not a fringe group and their theology, you know, it, it, it promotes a level of extremism when it comes to Israel. So these are just a few examples of why I think Israel makes people so crazy sometimes. Yeah, um, I'm going to end there. I could have, a, I've got many, many more questions. I'd love to ask you, Daniel, and thank you for your fulsome answers. But now it's, everybody should be buying the book to to read it for yourselves and just see how how clever it is and how comprehensive and asks really, really difficult questions. Grapples, wrestles. I think that whole image of Jacob wrestling is something that runs through the book as well. It wrestles with with thorny issues in a really um, evocative and um, very serious way. That's wonderful, wonderful book. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Sharon, who is going to um, ask some questions or field some of the questions from people who have joined us. Thank you so much, Thank Alana. You. Thank you, Daniel. Um, as Alana said, you should all get a copy of the book and read it because there's lots to get out of it. It's, a, it's literally just come into Australia, but it is available on Bloomsbury or Booktopia and a few other sites, you can order it online. Um, we are very excited to have in our hands, but I strongly recommend you get them yourself and read it and get to the source. If you'd like to ask a question yourself, can you please raise your hand in the reactions part of the Zoom? And I'll um, give you a chance to ask Daniel your questions. If you'd like me to answer the question for you, just put it in the chat and I'll be happy to ask on your behalf. Michael, you are first up. Would you like to unmute yourself? Michael Hershon. Hi, uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, and thank you, Alana and Daniel, for a very interesting discussion. <clears throat> um, Daniel, I thought you made an interesting point early on that a lot of observers and people interested in Israel tend to know one narrative and not the other. And I'm interested in your book. Uh, I have to apologise. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, That's okay. I understand <laughs> only just arrived in Australia, but I will. Um, what are the aspects of the Palestinian narrative that you think Jewish people tend not to be so familiar with and that it's important for you know, people who've been brought up in the Jewish community to understand? Um, Michael, thanks for, thanks for that question. Uh, so I'm re I'm, I, I, uh, on Tuesday, I'm doing a debate, a virtual debate out of all places, Harvard, with the author of another book about Israel, a, an Israeli actress and producer who now lives in Hollywood, who wrote a book that superficially looks a bit like mine. So that's why I think they asked us to have this debate. So then I had to read her book. Um, uh, and one of the things that was stunning to me was the lengths that she went to, to undermine the Palestinian narrative. To, to you know, and she did it in a very sort of tricky way by saying like, you know, I'm not saying I think this, but many people have said, but it was it was almost Trumpian in that straw person usage that, you know, Palestinians, some people say that Palestinians haven't been here for very long. This whole idea of Nakba, which is the Arabic word for catastrophe, how Palestinians refer to um, the events of 1948 and their dispossession from their land and, and, and the homes, their homes, you know, that's a recent term that was only coined in the 60s, right, as if Zionism was a term that went back a thousand years. Um, and I, as I read it, I was sort of sort of stunned at the extent to which there is an industry, right, a Hasbara industry um, 
matched only by the efforts on the other side, which is, of course, has a lot less power in the discourse to try to um, undermine Jewish and Israeli claims to the land. But there's a there's a there's a an industry meant to cast doubt on the Palestinian connection to the land. And so, you know, what I think is most important for readers, American, Australian, you know, non-Israeli, non-Palestinian readers to understand is that these attempts to 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 try to obviate or undermine or erase the connection of Palestinians to the land, or for that matter, Jews to the land, are, are will never convince anyone on the side you're trying to erase that they don't feel the, the, the way that they feel, right? So that so that I think you know part of my job in the book, and, and again, I, I I spend a lot more time on the Israeli Jewish narrative because, as I explain at the beginning of the book, not only is that the narrative that's dominant in my country. And I believe in your country, and not only is it the tradition that I come from, I think it's the narrative that's most badly in need of evolution and and some critical reappraisal. So I I would hope that readers would understand that um, the Palestinians have a a real and genuine connection to this place, that um, for them the events of 1948 were traumatic, a trauma that still you know echoes down the ages. Again. To quote Ben Gurion, and I use this quote in the book, I'll, I'll paraphrase him. Of all people, Ben Gurion wrote, "Yes, there was Auschwitz and the Holocaust, but what was that to them? All they know is we came here and stole their hope." And I think it's important, as painful as it is for 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 us, for for people who are reading th- this book and who are encountering this issue, to understand the depth of that trauma, because how can we be for? As I am, by the way, how can we be supportive of? self-determination for all peoples, including the Jewish people, but but deny that same right to self-determination to the Palestinian people. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, there's a question in the chat from your Nate about your chapter on BDS and that as diaspora Jews, that's something that many people sort of struggle with how to engage with. Can you maybe share how you addressed it and how you sort of mm-hmm. came to terms with what you what your conclusion was around it? Yeah, the, the 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 chapter title there is what we talk about when we talk about BDS, and I chose that um, as an homage to a short story. Um, and there have been many homages to that short story title. But really, part of why I, I what I wanted to do in that chapter was sort of unpack this this issue, right? Um, especially at a time when we see um, boycotts of the settlement enterprise being conflated. By, by the government of Israel, in law, by the way, and now by by state governments in the U.S. in, in laws here, um, and by some of the defenders of Israel, settle, b- attempts to boycott the settlements are being conflated with the global boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, which is an actual thing that was founded in 2005 by a guy called Omar Bargudi, uh, who lives now in Seattle, Washington State, a uh, couple of hundred miles north of where I am. <clears throat> I am. And the BDS movement uh, aims to treat Israel as South Africa, and it urges uh, all countries and all peoples to cut political, economic, military, social, academic, and cultural ties with Israel. I don't support that, nor does the New Israel Fund. I think it's the wrong set of tools um, to use in, in this challenging situation. Uh, that said, I don't think it ought to be criminalized, and, and let's be very clear, it is being criminalized. It's, it's in Israel. It's a civil offense to call for a boycott, divestment, or sanction of Israel or the territories under Israel's control, as Hoka Cherem, the boycott law, is 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 worded. Um, and the an amendment to Israel's entry law means that anyone who is a non-Israeli who calls for boycott, divestment, or sanction from Israel or territories under Israel's control is to be denied entrance into the country. So I think that. Penalizing and criminalizing freedom of expression is highly problematic, even though I don't uh, personally support the BDS movement. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we have is 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 that conflation, right? The, now, one of the reasons I don't support the BDS movement is because I think the goals of many of the founders of that movement um, are are not just to boycott and divest and sanction Israel until it leaves the West Bank, but they're in pursuit of a different political arrangement. One, by the way, that I don't think is, you know, I don't think is necessarily evil. It's just not one that that I or NIF uh, supports, right? Um, which is to say the the erasure of, of Israel and the erasure of the two-state solution. If the peoples of the territory one day want a one-state solution, 
gay gesund, right? They should have one. But until then, you know, I still think that the least impossible of the impossible resolutions um, are two states for two peoples who don't want to live together. Um, th that said, you know, the discourse around BDS has become so poisonous and, and, and treacherous that you have situations like the president of Israel, who is a friend of the new Israel fund, um, or has been, right? Uh, Bougie Herzog calling the ice cream company, Ben and Jerry's economic terrorists because of their, uh, pledge no longer to sell their ice cream in Jewish settlements in the West Bank. You could disagree with that. By the way, I don't disagree with that. I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do, to not sell ice cream in the West Bank. I try not to buy West Bank products, as do many of my Israeli friends. Um, but to call them terrorists for doing it, economic terrorists or anti-Semites, as Prime Minister Bennett did, that's just ludicrous and it's simply not true. So what I wanted to do in that chapter was to really try to unpack this, show why someone like me doesn't support the BDS movement, but also doesn't think it's evil, right? It is ultimately a nonviolent, peaceful set of tactics aimed at getting Israel to change. Um, and even if we don't agree with their application in this circumstance, you know, we have to be able to hold uh, in, in two hands a lot of complicated and difficult pieces and denigrating everyone who supports the BDS movement as anti-Semites seems to me to be a big misread of people's intentions, not everyone, but many people, and also a big mistake. Thank you. I think it, it shows some of that gray that Alana was referring to earlier. That it's yeah. very complicated. Shuri, can you um, unmute yourself, please? Yep, yeah, sorry. I've just got two quick questions. Um, so one is um, many Jews, like in both here and in America, are quite progressive on a number of issues, could be refugees, climate, mm -hmm. social justice, et cetera, but they have a real blind spot when it comes to Palestinian human rights. So I'm interested in what you have to say about that. Second thing, um, it's so easy with an Australian passport to go and visit the West Bank when with a 20 minute bus ride from East Jerusalem uh, to go and see things for yourself, the how people are living in the West Bank and what they have to put up with. And yet I've been trying to get my friends to go there for years and I don't think I've succeeded with one person yet, but um, I'm just wondering why, like, and they'll say things like, oh, it's dangerous, it's this, it's that. Like, they just seem to have this real resistance that seems like, um, I'm just wondering why you think that is, that is it a, just a, a deliberate thing not, not to want to be faced with, to be confronted with what the reality is, because then you might be forced to actually modify your position somewhat. Well, what do you think? Well, to answer your second question first, yes, I think that's lots of, I mean, I assume you're referring to Australians and others and not Israelis. Oh yeah, um, no, Israelis, no. Um, but yes, I do think your, 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 your guess is exactly right. I mean, this is a very painful, very difficult thing to confront. So many people might feel frightened or uncomfortable, but, but, but it's also an, I mean, those of you who have been to the West Bank, you know, it's a, can be a pretty traumatic experience. There's, um, one of my favorite organizations here in the States is called Encounter. It's a small organization that takes Jewish community leaders when they go to Israel, it takes them for a few days to meet with real Palestinians in the West Bank. And it's transformative. It's not, it's, it's not Hasbara or propaganda from any side. They're just sitting with real people and hearing about their real lives and seeing for themselves. And you have people who come out of that um, encounter with encounter transformed. They're not anti-Israel activists. They're like us. I mean, I don't want to make any assumptions about who's on this call, but but I'll make one, but, but I'll make a slight assumption that most of us are NIF people. And, uh, and what happens when these people go on encounter is that they come with a more nuanced uh, understanding of the grays and an understanding of, of the, the painful reality of life in the, in the territory. So, so I, I, I do think that's, I think you're right. And I think that's why, and I think that's part of the answer are, are, are programs like encounter. And, and as for, um, the first part of your question, which, right, which was about, remind me, was it, why are Jews so, um, remind me of the first part of your question? Many Jews who are progressive on other yeah, issues. Yeah, 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 right. Refugees, climate, social yep. justice generally, but got it. the Palestinian human rights. Mm, got a Thanks for and, and, and Daniel, I'll just add to that, that there's a question in the chat around intergenerational trauma around the Holocaust and how do how can we enable such Jews to also be more compassionate towards Palestinians who have that in their family and in their trauma? Yeah, 
So those are good related questions, Sharon, and and thank you for bearing with me. It's now almost one in the morning, so uh, so I'm, I'm, my active listening is falling a little bit apart. Look, I think that um, in a sense, the second question goes a long way towards answering the first one. You know, we have sort of a jokey word for it, um, PEP, we call it, progressive, except Palestinians. And it does describe many Jews, and I think part of the reason why is how we're educated, right? The part of the elephant that we have always felt and, and feel strongly to be true. But part of it is a, um, and part of it is that we have been sort of fed a set of stories that don't always reflect reality, which is why a program like Encounter can tend to nuance that position. But part of it is a very real intergenerational trauma um, that, that, that comes to us from the Holocaust and from what happened before the Holocaust to the Jewish people. And so, you know, I, I sometimes feel like everybody involved in this story is suffering from intergenerational post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Jews and, and, and Palestinians alike um, because of, as I said, because of the way we have been victimized and the way we have victimized each other and sometimes victimized ourselves. So, so I, I, I think that's part of why we have so many progressive liberal Jews who, when it comes to Israel, out of a sense of self-defensiveness and, and um, an understandable reaction to terrible trauma, um, can't quite extend the, the, um, the uh, largesse, the openness of heart that they're able to, to many other subjects when it comes to this one. And I think part of the answer to this is it's only a part of the answer I know is our, our programs like Encounter and I'll and I'll tell you here's a little bit of insider NIF news you know one of the things that we're thinking a lot about in terms of programs and and supporting efforts um, within Israel are are ways to bring to make the reality in the West Bank proximate to Israelis which may seem like a funny thing to say since so many of them end up serving in the West Bank but really beyond that there's virtually no contact now between um, especially Jewish Israelis and the reality in the West Bank and making it proximate, making it so that you can't actually only live your life never thinking about what's happening on the other side of that literal wall, which, by the way, parenthetically, I'll only speak for the U.S., not Australia, but like we do that here all the time. Right. I mean, it, 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 in Los Angeles, California, you just all you have to do is not go south of the 10 freeway and, and you don't have to see South Central Los Angeles you know, massive under-resourced African-American neighborhoods. So that kind of division within a small geographic space is not unique to Israel. What's of course unique to Israel among the democracies is a 54-year-old settlement enterprise and occupation. And, and there, I think getting people proximate is the way that you begin to unravel some of the hardening that happens through all of this trauma. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious that it's 1 a.m. in San Francisco. Um, I think we'll leave on the last point. Um, the book has a number of profiles at the end. You, you have Gadi Gvariao, Matas Mali, different activists that you come across through your work with NIF. And I thought as Hanukkah literally sort of fades out and the light ends for the year here in, um, in Australia. You may have a few more hours in the US still. It'd be nice if you could leave us with a, a hopeful story, either from one of them or from someone else that you've come across through your work at NIF that inspires you today and gives you the hope to continue the work that you do. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it can get a little depressing when we have a conversation like this. Um, but the fact is, the irony is, I mean, I don't want to speak for Liam, uh, but, but I think when, you are, when you've done this work for a long time, um, one of the most meaningful and powerful points of connection um, to to the whole issue, to the whole place, uh, you know, in, in addition to those of us like me who have family who live in Israel and who have lived in Israel and who love the place are the activists that we support. They are the people who inspire you and give you hope uh, and make you realize that nothing is preordained and nothing is inevitable and nobody sees a Yitzhak Rabin coming. No one sees an F.W. de Klerk opening up the gates on Robben Island and Mandela coming out. Um, nobody ever sees these things coming. They don't see the Berlin Wall coming down. But those things don't happen in a vacuum, right? They happen because of decades or centuries of hard work uh, on the part of countless people whose names you never know 
who are moving things. They're bending the arc, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, right? They're, they're working to bend the arc towards justice under the radar screen, not in the headlines, until one day they have helped create circumstances they've, th that, that allow for, they've, they've tilled the soil so that new things can blossom. And those three people that you named that I, that I end the book with in the chapter of The Case for Hope, you know, um, you know, my son Jaljuli is a, an Arab citizen of Israel who, when she was a, a young, uh, a teenager, um, saw, uh, witnessed Mer Kahana, right, the radical racist inciter American Israeli rabbi who was banned from serving in the Knesset because uh, during Shamir, during a Likud government because of his racism, when he and his followers tried to come to her village, um, the villagers decided they would sort of try to have a human wall to prevent them from entering. And as they stood there, suddenly buses and vans and cars from neighboring Jewish uh, towns and villages started showing up and their fellow Israelis stood with them to, to keep Kahana. And as she writes, uh, in, 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 as she says, and the idea of Kahana from entering our town. And that was imprinted on her soul. And throughout all of the activism and the disappointments and discrimination, that's the vision of Israel that sustains her. And I'll, I'll just tell you that one story, you know, and, and then I'll tell you one last one. Gadi Gvaryahu, right, a, a religious Israeli, uh, uh, um, uh, Orthodox Jew, native Israeli, who, who um, after the price tag attacks, these are kind of radical settlers who would target Palestinians to, to uh, exact a price whenever they felt that that price needed to be exacted from, from innocent Palestinians. Um, Gadi began going with a few other religious friends to show up at the West Bank village or the Arab town in Israel where a mosque had been torched or a car had been damaged or even worse, people had been hurt or attacked. Um, and uh, he would show up to sort of bear witness. And um, you remember the horrific murder of the boy uh, a Palestinian, an Arab kid from East Jerusalem, was kidnapped, brought to the Jerusalem fire, and burned alive. Right when when Gadi uh, and and his group asked to come and pay essentially a shiva call to the parents, the parents said yes, we 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 would we would be honored if you'd come. And then when uh, when Jews were murdered at prayer in a synagogue in Jerusalem by Palestinian terrorists a few years ago. Palestinians who had received those shiva calls called Gadi and said, can we come and pay a shiva call to the, the, the families of those who were murdered? And the family said, yes, you can. And thus really was born this movement, um, Tag Ma'ir, which is appropriate at Hanukkah, light tag. Mm -hmm. um, it means a play on words on price tag uh, because they were founded during Hanukkah. Um, and now it's truly this, this inter, uh, you know, intercommunal, um, uh, multi-faith, effort by religious Jews, Christians, and Muslims, uh, Israelis and Palestinians to say not in our name, no to sectarian violence. We have to figure out a way to work together and we will stand with each other. And if you can hear those stories of Maisam and Gadi and others and, and be unmoved and still feel cynical and hopeless, then you are much tougher than I am because there are tens of thousands of them in Israel and they're the reason why uh, I do what I do. Thank you. Having had the pleasure of meeting people like Daddy, it really is inspiring to see that people don't give up and they're willing to keep, you know, making, being part of that change that they want to see in Israel. And I hope that all of you feel that, you know, the work that we're doing and the work that NIF is supporting is helping to make that change that you want to see on the ground. And we are being ably led by not only the CEO, but also the author of this wonderful book, Daniel. Um, we encourage you all to buy the book and to read it and learn more about the stories that he shared, just a snippet of what he shared with us today. But thank you so much for taking the time in the middle of the night to speak with us. Thank, thank you, Alana, you for, for taking here. the time um, to do the Q&A. And we're really looking forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully next year, um, in actual face-to-face -face events, um, possibly even with international speakers. But uh, we can't wait to see you in 2022 and um, all the best. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Daniel.